Hello, I'm Aziz Hanifa, the former executive editor of India Abroad. And today it's an absolute delight to be together with a friend of mine, Sheila Murthy, uh, a top-notch lawyer, and to discuss a fascinating biography uh, written by Aditi Roy. Uh, Sheila, uh, let's start uh, right at the outset with the title of the book, Being Sheila. It's a very powerful and intriguing title uh, that captures the essence of the book. Uh, can you talk to that, how it came about? So the author and myself, Aditi Rao, and myself sort of went around about, you know, how do we, so all kinds of fancy, snazzy stuff. But in the end, she said, you know, the, sometimes the simplest is the most eloquent and the most beautiful. The less is more philosophy. And so she said, let's go with just being Sheila, because it's all about you, your soul, your work, your life, your journey. And then she decided to add the byline, the title, because people may not know what being Sheila is about, because they could be any other Sheilas, though, of course, in, 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 in America, the name Sheila with two E's is so uncommon because yes. the American is either E-I e -I or I-E -E yeah. that, you know, I don't want to claim like I'm a, like Oprah, first name basis, the world knows Sheila. Yeah. But I think that was that was what they were trying to to get to the essence, the soul of the person, make it a one name, you know, the name itself. And then the byline would confirm if you already heard of Sheila or Sheila Murthy, yeah. Murthy.com, that the life journey of an immigration lawyer would sort of jump out at you. And, and the author, Aditi Roy, is based in India. And upon reading the book, it's clear that you spent a lot of time with her. Uh, what was the process like? It was very intense. She is like all perfectionists, people who are after a mission, a goal to get to it. She literally hounded me, chased me, followed me. Every trip I made to India, she kept asking me questions, follow-up questions. She would write a draft and then get see clarification. She wanted to understand that she, ensure that she understood nuances and complexities of U.S. immigration law in the process. Uh, and pick up my personality. And then she asked to speak with my sisters, my mother, uh, she just wanted to talk to everybody and everybody connected and everything connected with me. Now, it was harder to get Vasant, as most of you know, Vasant is a very know. private person, my husband. Yeah. And so getting him to um, speak was harder. So she went and spoke to Vasant's sister, who knew him from the time he was a little boy, baby, because it's a sister who's 12 years older than Vasant. And because she found out and has a connection to that sister, she found out the story about the Nayaks and their background and their life, stories that even Vasant may not have known as a small child. Yeah. So an education of Vasant also about who Sheila Murthy is all about. And, For sure. And For the sure. book contains dozens of anecdotes, uh, many heartbreaking stories too. And for many of your clients, you are like the last line of defense uh, between deportation and the continued stay in the U.S. It gives the readers an insight into the work you do on a daily basis and how much you fight on, their, fight on their behalf. Can you talk to that in terms of what drives you in that direction, in terms of being such an indefatigable advocate? So like, like each of us have our own DNA that we're born with, I think mine from my childhood was always about fighting for the rights for others, fighting for justice, fighting against injustice, fighting for women's rights, for the rights of the downtrodden and the underprivileged. And so, I, and, and as many of you know from the story that I often talk about how, you know, growing up back then in India, and I hear that it hasn't changed completely yet, 35, 40 years later, is that if you're not a doctor or an engineer, you're pretty much not considered brilliant in many Asian cultures, including in India. And so when I said, I'm going to fight for justice and the rights for others, my father was like, that's fine. You can do it on the side, but how will you feed your family? How will you yeah. eat? How will you pay the bills? And my attitude always was, you know what? it's okay, I don't need a million dollars to eat food or to sleep on a nice bed at night. All I need is to help others. And that was my 
childhood, my burning passion, my mission. And so when someone says that the government has given a denial, which many times I think is either illegal, improper, unjust, uh, you know, that they are not really understanding the nuances of the case, because if they understood that there is legal maneuvering angles available, that there is humanitarian angles, that there is personal connections, I think that everybody, I'm convinced that majority of people in this world are good people. Even the people that we think are bad people have many, many good qualities in them. And so it is my job as a lawyer, my, my responsibility to bring out the kindness and the humanity of another human being to show them how to open their mind and their heart and their soul and give this approval or approve this visa stamp or issue the approval if it's a USCIS officer or ask the CBP, the Customs and Border Protection at the airport, why you should let this person or family into the country. Because sometimes just quoting the law is like a doctor just, you know, following the doing the surgery, but with no passion, compassion, heart and soul in the work. As human beings, we are only complete if we truly give a portion of our love, our compassion and heart to people, especially in areas like immigration, which is such a deeply intense, personal, life-changing process for people. The ability to live and work in America, the ability to send money back to their families in India or any other part of the world, uh, the ability of financial freedom, of intellectual options, of job satisfaction, of putting food on the table, of changing the destiny of America. Those are just such important goals. And at the core of it, I mean, America is a nation of immigrants. Pretty much everyone comes from, came from somewhere unless you're a Native American. And so I just feel like, where does that come from? It comes from passion, compassion, the desire not to just accept and say, okay, okay, yep, yeah, you want to deny the case, no problem, I'm gonna sleep at night. No, it's not right. The book also talks a lot about your relationship with your father, who comes across as a very lovable and doting parent. Uh, you are very close to him, undoubtedly. Uh, and it also talks about your relationship with your younger sister, Suman, whom you took under your wing right from the day she was born. Uh, but you were also very forthright with your parents' relationship and the many differences uh, they had. Uh, you know, you talk about your mother who was a tough disciplinarian uh, who, who probably uh, set you right every time you, you know, wavered and all that. Can you speak to that relationship uh, first with your father, then the fact that the way you took your sister Suman under your wing and also the, tough, uh, the toughness of your mother, which probably made you into what you are today. Yeah, for sure. I think every child, every human being, we need love because that's what opens the soul and the heart. But you also need tough love and you need people who have boundaries and who have expectations. And usually it's our parents. And so my mother was this tough disciplinarian who believed that if you don't push, you don't try, you don't work hard, you don't make sacrifices, you will never come up in life. My father, who was very loving, caring, and kind, but also wanted us intellectually uh, to, to do well. And my baby sister, who gave me a lot of purpose and meaning in life to want to live because the tension at home, and I hesitated, and even the author asked me, do you want to talk about uh, in detail about your parents, uh, you know, not getting along? And I thought it was important because of course in America, we grow up with a much different attitude. In yeah. India, there is generally the feeling of let's hide behind, you know, under the covers. Yeah. Let's not be honest because people will say, oh my God, that's terrible that the marriage was not a, ter a wonderful marriage or whatever. But uh, in America, there is a much less judgmental issue. It's more, you know, it actually Candy. makes it more endearing and relatable and more human, yeah. more of a human being because every family has its crazy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And problems and marital problems and tension and children who grow up in that can get a little bit warped and yeah. we are not, you know, but it can also make us tough and strong. Yeah. And let's face it. Even in America, you have one in two households, pretty close to one in two households where there's divorce and unhappy. And before the divorce, there's always tension and unhappiness. 
Um, and in India, in America, the f attitude is that, um, you know, it's better to be from a broken home than in, in a broken home. In a broken home yeah. But in, in India, it's a very different attitude. It's, it's better to be in the broken home than from a broken home because no one will marry the daughters or, you know, or, or no, no, that it's going to be creating a set, you know, sensation in the community with divorce, especially, you know, 35, 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. And so I think that all of those relationships, the, the incredible love that I had with my father and I just, we connected at a very deep human level. Um, and I felt I could feel his love in everything I did. And he was like this guiding star for me in many ways. My mother, whom I actually was annoyed with because I felt she put a lot of pressure and expected so much out of me. Uh, I only started to appreciate her more in my starting in my 30s increased in my 40s and now I'm in my 50s very it's coming pretty close to the late 50s end of the late 50s at this point but in even in th this decade I think my appreciation for her has grown I think we do as they said when you're young you don't appreciate the sacrifices of our parents and then as we grow older we get to appreciate them and so I think that my mother being a tough no nonsense kind of person growing up in a country like India where a lot of women are asked or expected to play a subservient or secondary role, she did not tolerate or have any of it in her life. Yeah. Even though she likes to think she was, yeah. that's the best part of it. And so she was constantly telling us verbally, oh, you should be subservient, you should listen to your husband. Yet one day she didn't and never ever listen to, to my father. <laughs> and so I think they say children only observe what by your, by your actions more than by your words. Yes. And so I think I just grew up very comfortable and I'm very, very blessed to have Vasant who is so loving, caring, kind, mature, sensible, looks like a Sufi saint so, so often, Absolutely. right? Yeah, that's so, what I was. That's what I was coming to. You know, uh, I met Vasant. He's low profile. He's unassuming. You know, he likes to be behind the scenes. But he's been your rock. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you talk about your relationship in the book and and how he has been such a rock in your life. But in some ways, you guys are just polar opposites. You know, you're you're gregarious. You're animated. You're vivacious. And Vasant is, you know, they say, hey, let me be, just let me be, you know. Uh, talk to the, talk to how he has been such a rock. In, in spite of people not necessarily uh, knowing him, uh, would think that he's been such a go-to kind of guy. Yeah, it's just incredible. I did not, never having seen a very loving, caring uh, marriage in my own parents, with my parents in my own, in our own home growing up, or even with my actually aunts and uncles, many of whom we were very close with. My favorite aunt, my mother's older sister, whom we call Dodama, big mother. Yeah. Uh, their marriage was not, unfortunately, a good one either. Uh, you know, so I just didn't grow up seeing or hearing of good, solid, rock solid relationships of love and of equal partners. There was one aunt who had a good marriage, but again, her role was a little more subservient, in my opinion, or if not subservient, at least she played second fiddle, let him kind of, you know, rule the roost in some ways. And um, just... I think that I knew I deserved more. I think every human being in the world deserves love and happiness. Why not? Yeah. Why shouldn't every human being? And so I prayed a lot for the right relationship. God must have heard my prayer. Yeah. I knew that it takes a lot of give and take in life because you know we both have had to learn and embrace. I think Vasant obviously is far more the patient of the two of us. I'm sure it was harder for him, but he said that I add energy and excitement and fun to his life. And he adds stability, sensibility. And when I make mistakes, he never yells like most people, like most normal people, I should say, you know, His, he'll more very softly and gently say, you know, are you proud of the way you're, the tone in which you're talking to me now? <laughs> or do you think I deserve it? Do you think I did? What do I, what did I do to deserve it, Sheila? Yeah. And then you feel so terrible. It's like, oh my God. So remorseful. <laughs> it's almost like, you know, 
what a <laughs> jerk. I must be such a horrible human being. Yeah. To, so sometimes you get, what are the famous saying, right? The famous words, you can get more bees with honey than with vinegar. Yes. And so his kindness, his questioning, his gentleness. Um, but again, he's a very strong and tough man. Don't push him. Yeah. Because if you do something, I remember once when I was fairly newly married where he said, you know, even if I love you, if you continue to talk in a certain way to me in a condescending or rude or tough, mean way, then even if I love you, I'm just going to have to leave you. I'm going to be gone. And the tone and the manner in which he spoke, it wasn't loud. It wasn't an idle threat. I knew 100% it would be true. Yeah. And so it was a, like a bucket of cold water. It woke me up. It made <laughs> me realize that I need to behave properly and decently and i don't know where we all give ourselves permission to abuse people mentally emotionally psychologically physically every human being does it to another human being sometimes more brazenly and sometimes more subtly yeah. and i think maybe it's the power plates the law of the jungle because at the end of the day we we are you know so i think there's psychology and sociology and you know all kinds of issues and in, subtly involved but I think that if we embrace somebody who is 180 degrees opposite from us, and we are able to acknowledge that we can learn from another person, that we can surround ourselves with people who are completely different, while it is a little overwhelming and daunting, I think it can work out to be a very powerful and life-changing and soul growing it's an opportunity for the soul and spirit to grow uh, app apparently your sort of eureka moment was reading the iconic book uh, to kill a mockingbird uh, and this was when you were really recovering from a very very bad illness at the age of 10 uh, that was when you decided to be become a lawyer how did how did that all work out uh, what's the sort of equation behind it so, I, you know, some people ask, was there a pull and a push? So for the way I looked at it is, you know, in like, I, like we spoke about earlier, I just, I knew I can't stand blood. So medicine was out of the question. There was no doctor yeah. bone in me. Engineering, again, I hated mathematics. I didn't love it. I couldn't see myself spending my life doing that. I, I, in India, you have compared to here, sometimes maybe having too many options can be a negative because we, in India, you didn't have too many. So, yeah. you know, it's like, okay, what can you be a journalist, a lawyer, an artist, doctor, an engineer or architect. So there's a, a far more finite list of things to pursue. And I looked at all of the options and I thought, I really don't like any of these Lawyer, I can see because I believe I want to fight for others. And even walking on the road, if somebody would do something, I would stop and say, why are you talking to that person like that? So I knew that there was some part of me that connected on a deeper level. And so to see that justice can be rendered by a person who, you know, believes that the role that we can play as lawyers can be so life altering, I think gave me a sense of purpose, a sense of a feeling of being larger than myself, a purpose much larger than me, and just gave me a goal to strive for. And so it just made perfect sense. As soon as I finished my bachelor's degree in history and political science, the next thing was, okay, where am I going to go to law school? And back those days, there wasn't any other, uh, the best law school in Bangalore was University Law College. The national law schools had not yet opened up in India. In fact, I was there for the groundbreaking uh, of the discussion with uh, some of the top leading lawyers and jurists and judges who came to our college near close by to, to start the, the process. It wasn't even the building. It was the process of starting the thought of how to create law, law school similar to the IITs and similar to Harvard Law School to create a certain caliber that was much higher than what we were used to back then 35 years ago. And a fascinating anecdote in the book is how you met then uh, Karnataka Chief Minister Ramakrishna Hegde and pleaded your case to send you uh, to New York for the mute court. The several meetings you had and how you were sort of unrelenting uh, in trying to convince him that you got to do this for me. Uh, speak to that. Yeah. So what do they say? Necessity is the mother of all invention. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, honestly, 
my parents were middle class. My father was an army officer and my mother was a school teacher on and off over the years. Uh, you know, the kind of money that we needed, I forget what it was exactly, but it was a lot of money back then. I think it was may have been 25,000 rupees each. Yeah. I mean, it's like almost $25,000 a person. Yeah, today, yeah. You know? oh, even more, much more. Yeah, so it was a lot of money. And, um, you know, we had done so well. You know, the the amount of money involved in having to buy two airline tickets to travel to from India to the United States, to stay at the hotel, to be able to participate in the moot court competitions, yeah. the Philip C. Jessup International Moot Court Competitions, uh, to represent India. First time Karnataka had ever won uh, the, this very prestigious All India Moot Court competition. When, when, when it was mentioned that, hey, why don't you apply, approach the government of Karnataka for asking for funds? And uh, like a pit bull, like, a, like one who's possessed. <laughs> once, <laughs> once the idea is planted in my mind, I just cannot let go. I cannot, yeah. I just go on like a mad person. Any other normal person would have given up. There were times they said, forget it. We don't have the funds. We cannot do it. Go away. Yeah. And I would sit there and I would bring my books and study and read and wait for others. Typical politicians, we would be waiting for them. His PA was very helpful, would be very kind and nice. I also used, I think, Donna Fernandez, Michael Fernandez to talk to them. It was like I, everybody and any opportunity I could, I said, you know, why can't we get this funding? What, what, it is only going to bring pride and glory to Karnataka. We are going to be very helpful. Otherwise, we cannot even participate in this. Um, you know, uh, my mother at one time said, I can lend you some money. You can borrow some from the bank. And I said, no, I cannot do yeah. that. I cannot start my life borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. Yeah. And what if I can't give it back? I just don't like the idea of doing that. And so I just continued to wait and be patient and pursue it and just go, 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 go dozens of times till I guess they finally caved in. I remember the night that or whatever that he called, he told me, he told uh, Michael Fernandez, uh, he, they called and said it has been approved. And I was like ecstatic because that meant now that I could just focus on the competition and excelling yeah. and not wasting hours waiting in corridors to have a uh, audience and to try to convince and speak with Chief Minister Ram Krishna Hegde. Uh, Aditi also does a great job in terms of revealing how you got involved uh, in each of your philanthropic ventures, your support of the Girl Scouts, the Harvard Scholarship, education activities in India. Uh, it's, it's quite fascinating. Uh, how, did, how did this sort of parallel universe of yours uh, evolve? I think a part of it, again, was my father's influence and, uh, you know, motivation that to whom much is given, much is expected, that if in life you are ever fortunate to make some money more than you can eat and sleep, keep a little bit for a rainy day, don't, don't sacrifice and give up on things that are important to you in your life. But at the end of the day, money is primarily meant to empower and uplift others, to give opportunities for others. And if no one had done that for him, he would have been a poor boy. And if he was poor and lived that way, we all wouldn't have been, Harvard wouldn't even have, forget Harvard moot court, nothing would have been on the cards. Yeah. So it's interesting how he grew up poor. He made it a point that we needed to do more for the world and support other organizations and people. And so I look at the connection, you know, whether it was senior citizens of Bangalore doing the wonderful work that they do in India to feed and educate uh, and provide nutritious meals to children. The Girl Scouts of Central Maryland, where they help the Beyond Bars program, where their parents, the mothers were incarcerated in, and to give these women an opportunity to, to meet network. The United Way, which supports so many multitudes of charities locally and even was expanding globally and internationally. And that I really truly felt does so much in the communities, very organized. They had the automatic paycheck you know, deductions for contributions. So each of these different, and the American Immigration Council, of course, the essay, the poetry writing contests for middle school America with the title, Why I Am Proud That America is a Nation of Immigrants. Or every single charity that Vasant 
Nayak, my husband and myself both contribute is something that pulls at the heartstrings for us, something that we can relate to, that we connect with. Vasant actually has started doing a lot more work now with respect to photography and photo education in India for poorer people and through different organizations. In fact, he's giving contributing to the Kobe Chobe Mela in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, because our goal ultimately is to educate, empower, enlighten, and inspire so that the way our, my father's life changed for good. His father also came from a poorish family. His father came out of the same cycle of poverty. And if they hadn't done what they did, we wouldn't have been so fortunate. And so I think we have felt so blessed in our lives that we have always wanted to go and do something to touch another heart. And as my father would often say, and I think all of us know, we're never going to take anything with us. Nothing, nothing, not one rupee or dollar will come, will follow us. The only thing that will follow us in our lives, if we are so lucky, is the good will and the good love and the good energy and the good things that we have sowed on this earth that will continue to bear fruit long after we are gone. Uh, Sheila, uh, besides being a brilliant immigration lawyer and a driving force and going to bat for the underdog uh, and, and with officers both in the U.S. and internationally, uh, you're also a sort of uh, indefatigable uh, immigration advocate. And the last four years during the Trump administration, has been an awful time uh, with all of the xenophobia and the anti-immigrant fervor and the Stephen Millers of the world uh, who were just uh, absolutely uh, awful in terms of uh, what this country has been all about and that it's a country of immigrants. Uh, now with uh, Joe Biden coming in and of course uh, <clears throat> we all being able to acknowledge uh, the Indian American Vice President Kamala Devi Harris, and the fact that the Biden, uh, President Biden has uh, declared that he's going to overturn some of the very uh, nauseating kind of anti-immigration legislation, et cetera, that was all put about in terms of refugees, in terms of even uh, merit-based H-1Bs and other uh, visas, et cetera. Uh, where, do you, where do you want the Biden administration to go in terms of uh, you know, bringing back immigration to what it, is, what it really should be in terms of what this country, the United States of America is all about. Um, it is, I mean, the last four years certainly have been challenging to put it mildly. Yeah. Um, and we <clears throat> almost forgot that we are a nation of immigrants, that our whole country, our ethos, our culture is all about the Statue of Liberty, bring me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Um, and it is really a breath of fresh air that we are going back to um, under jo Joseph Biden and Kamala Harris, back to our fundamental roots. And by the way, this is not a political statement. Yeah. Again, for the record, I, I'm all, I make it a point to mention this over and over again, that I am a registered independent for over 20 years. And I have voted for equal, probably equal number of Republicans and Democrats. I look at the philosophy, the ideology, and a combination, because like many conservatives, I'm fiscally and financially pretty conservative, but socially very liberal. Yeah. I know some people refer to that as the Tea Party Republican. Tea yeah. Different terms are used, but it doesn't yeah. matter. At the end of the day, we love our country. We love the values it stands for. We love the Constitution and the rights enshrined in the Constitution. And so... When any person, and if that person happens to be the president, it doesn't matter. If that person breaks the law, violates the rule, violates the laws passed in the books and enshrined in the constitution, the principles enshrined in the constitution, then it is our job as individuals, uh, as people who love and care about our country, this great United States of America, and as people, who, and as lawyer, as a lawyer, I have to say to my clients, don't tolerate this. If you got a denial that is in violation of what the law, the statute, the regulations, their own policies have said, challenge it, sue them, sue them. And uh, to a large extent, my constantly inspiring, motivating and energizing the IT Serve Alliance uh, leadership, 
because many of them look to us as having been practicing for so many years. You know, what does this mean? Is there a risk to us? Will we be, you know, will there be repercussions against our organization or us as individuals? Which is a very common question that I think most um, Desis always feel, right? Because our concern always is, gee, do I want to challenge the, that to yeah. the president or the administration? And my attitude is no, you don't have to worry. Luckily, this is still the United States of America. You can sue the government you, and the same attorneys for the federal government will actually be happy to come over and have a cup of tea with you after the, uh, the, the, the discussion and after the lawsuit, irrespective of who wins, yeah. because they are also simply following the law just the way we are. They are doing their job to put food on their table for their families, just like we are. And so the country is completely, there is no repercussions, there's no fear. And so my attitude has been go, 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 go. Do I see a change? Already we are seeing the changes on the horizon, Aziz. We are seeing that uh, Biden has introduced reunification of families, created a bipartisan uh, uh, um, uh, interagency team to do that oh, as yeah. of yesterday. Brand new, uh, changed the asylum, to, wants to bring back 125,000 asylum seekers to America every year, uh, stop the, the, the clock of you know pretty much building the wall, stopping yeah. that huge waste of time, effort, energy. No physical wall will keep away a person or family that is hungry. And his focus, Joe Biden's focus on helping the economies in those countries get become more so that there's less temptation to for people to come over and cross the border into the United States. So everything that's being done seems to be more well thought of, thinking of longer, deeper purpose and vision, going back to the fundamentals of our country and our constitution. And I am extremely proud, pleased, and excited to see what we have on the horizon. And I'm hoping that it will continue for four years. And if God willing, as they say, inshallah, for the next eight years, you know, for all of us to continue to see deep, meaningful change and going back to the fundamentals of our country under Joseph R. Biden and Kamala Devi Harris. And if we are so blessed maybe, and if they do things right and they continue to lead it with believing in the values that they did, uh, I'm confident and convinced that people will vote for with our hearts, with our pocketbook and with our lives. Because at the end of the day, as I said, even a person who you think is not a good person, even if it's a murderer, a rapist, they have good qualities. Every human being has very good qualities. And is it, can we bring out the goodness in others as leaders or do we bring out the worst in another human being as a leader? That to me will speak volumes because I think a lot of the children marching in the Black Lives Matter kind of movement in the past couple of years after especially George Reynolds murder, uh, a lot of those are the children of many of the people who voted for Trump. I mean, that is what is amazing because the children are saying, I can't sleep at night. Our country has to have values. And so to see that people ultimately have goodness in them and the goodness I am convinced will always triumph over evil. In the short term, somebody may win and you may think life is so unfair, but I am convinced in the end that goodness, kindness, following the law, following the principles enshrined in our constitution, doing right by majority of the people. Now, we, one thing we know as leaders is you can never make every single person happy every single time. Yes. And that's fine. We can't. But you have to be fair and just, honest, and know that you are doing right in your mind, heart, soul, and body, and that you are being true to what you believe in fundamentally as a human being, to do right by your fellow human beings. And I'm what I've seen from of Joe Biden so far, it comes across that way. And so I'm excited for our country. And, and finally, Sheila, uh, getting back to your book, there is this very beautiful uh, poem, a very moving poem right at the beginning, right at the beginning of your book. Uh, could you just tell us the story behind that? Sure. So actually, this the winner of that poem, Kate Jens, uh, is a young middle school kid. I met her, of course, in Orlando. Uh, and she's just smart and bright and really sweet. She, by the way, ordered a copy of the book, both for herself, one copy, and her mother ordered a separate copy. Um, 
And they, uh, very talented, bright young girl uh, that wants to change the world, that shared the story about her grandmother who's from Italy that came here. Um, and just she sat down and apparently wrote it over a couple of sessions. Uh, she won the uh, essay competition uh, in her state, in her middle school, in her state, and then in the country, she was number one, the winner of the American Immigration Council's uh, creative essay writing contest on why I am proud that America is a nation of immigrants. So the book opens with one winner and it ends at the end and closes with another winner. And so we have this beautiful story of how she asks her grandmother to tell her about her immigration journey and coming to America and how it changed their lives. And that, that kid is in fact still in touch with me and I just got a, a you know, New Year Christmas card and greetings from them. Um, and I, I'm really excited and hopeful that this bright young girl will do something incredible and amazing with her life if we continue as older people and hopefully wiser to inspire and motivate and continue to make a difference in the lives of others then life is one big happy full circle it's the circle of life yeah. and that's my hope is for her to continue to shine it's a beautiful poem both in the beginning and in the end and I think that these are young, talented children who relate to their families, their ancestors, who embrace the notion of America as a nation of immigrants. I have often said at the American Immigration Council's meeting when introducing the essay contest winner, that if people like Donald Trump had attended, had participated in such a competition when he was in middle school, maybe we wouldn't be having the kind of xenophobic hatred and fear and insecurity that exists in America uh, by those who try to squish the voices of others who want to help enshrine the noble values in our constitution of freedom and liberty for all and embracing people from across the globe because that is what has made us such an incredibly great country, the world leader, because we are open to bringing the best and brightest from across the globe right within to our own shores. Thank you very much, Sheila. As always, it's been a fascinating conversation and what a what an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care of yourself and all the very best with the book. Thank you so much. And I appreciate your reading it and giving me your comments. And I'm very excited of sharing this story and hopefully motivating others. And I'm also looking forward to actually doing the writing and completing the memoir or biography, the autobiography that's been in the works for 10 years. Aditi Rao came and did this on a super fast track basis, but now I'm going to go back and do this and talk about other stories or expand upon some of the stories that we already had in this biography. So thank you again, Aziz. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. You're very welcome. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.